Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the final session of this very good webinar, really impressive. Uh, my name is Alafia Samuels, I'll be your chair for today. And we're going to be talking about national NCD commissions. Um, just briefly in terms of the history, um, in 2007, both Bermuda and Barbados formed national NCD commissions. They weren't called that exact name. Um, and then we had the Port of Spain declaration, and out of that declaration was the mandate from the heads to form multi-sectoral commissions or their equivalent um, in order to advance the NCD agenda, which we recognize is multi-sectoral. Um, across CARICOM, the performance of NCD commissions has been mixed over time. There have been challenges with autonomy, capacity, clout, and just longevity and how they are appointed. Um, but some commissions have been very successful, and we are going to hear from um, four commissioners today, um, four chairs of the commissions, to talk to us. We recall that, um, you know, NCDs were a challenge, and then came COVID, um, and COVID influenced the NCDs in multiple ways, um, including having higher disease and higher death among those living with NCDs, as well as um, challenging the food systems that we have and influencing the types of diets that we have available to us. So this is a time for NCD commissions to really reinvigorate and, and reshine. Um, we have to consider COVID as an opportunity um, and see how we can get the political agenda and political commitments um, to really kick in to help us advance this, this fight. Um, the Prime Ministers of the region have talked about food security. The Honourable Prime Minister Keith Rowley of Trinidad and Tobago and Honourable Prime Minister Mayor Motley have been very vocal. However, we do recognise that, um, as we heard earlier, uh, so much of our content of the food, and, and it came from the Pacific, and, and I'm so happy to have seen the Pacific Islands on this call. Um, we share so many commonalities, we really need to work together. Um, and in fact, we recognize that even with this concern about food insecurity, the plans put forward do not say anything about the 30% or so of our imports that are ultra processed foods. Um, so we may do import substitution, but still are importing the unhealthy foods, um, which we have not substituted for. So we are hoping to use this COVID um, epidemic as an opportunity to advance our cause and I'm going to be um, uh, sharing this panel with four chairs of NCD commissions. First, um, Sir Trevor Hassel, who has been the longest serving um, chair of NCD commissions and arguably um, a very successful NCD commission in Barbados. I had the honor of serving on it for about eight years. Um, so he will bring a lot of experience. We want to especially welcome back Dr. Leslie Ramsamy. He was a former Minister of Health in Guyana. He's now the chair of the Presidential NCD um, Commission, and we welcome him back to the NCD fold and the, the NCD struggle. Um, Dr. Damian Greaves is the chair of the National NCD Commission in Grenada, and Professor Trevor Ferguson, um, recently appointed chair of the National NCD Committee in Jamaica. Um, so welcome to you all. Um, just to say to the panelists, please, um, the answers need to be very tight, and we are really focused on the food and food security um, in this discussion on NCD commissions. So um, each panelist is going to be asked to respond in two minutes. I know that's tough, but please try. And so um, the first question I have for you is, how do we take advantage of the COVID opportunity in terms of trying to get um, you know, more impact in the political decision-making when it comes to NCD policies. And I'm gonna ask Professor Ferguson for two minutes and Dr. Greaves for two minutes. Dr. Fer Professor Ferguson. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Samuels. Good afternoon to everyone. It certainly is a pleasure to be part of this webinar. So COVID-19 has been a wake-up call for many in that we have seen that the 
um, NCDs have had a major impact on the morbidity and mortality related to the COVID-19 pandemic. So the majority of persons who are hospitalized, as well as those who end up dying from the um, disease, are those with NCDs. So the NCDs, um, particular conditions including diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, or respiratory disease, confers a greater risk of severe disease as well as um, risk for mortality. And what this has done is that it has brought to the fore the importance of NCDs as a contributor to our overall health burden. And therefore, um, I think certainly from the public health officials, as well as also from politicians and policy makers, that the importance of NCDs has been heightened. Um, there is still a concern, however, because I think that at the individual level, that many persons may, while they may hear about the comorbidities and the risk associated with NCDs, may not particularly consider themselves at high risk. First of all, there are several persons who are unaware of their condition, and therefore it may not result in behavior change. So persons may still be carrying on as per usual until they really become ill. So I think that's important for us to try to, to ensure that persons begin to take this opportunity to say, um, you know, how can we increase awareness? How can we increase screening? Because persons need to know their risk status so that if they were to contract um, COVID, they have an idea as to what are some of the factors. For the public health official, I think it certainly will have had a major impact. Um, I don't think anyone can escape the hospital beds being full to capacity and exceeding capacity, the need for ICU space that we do not have, and the real burden that is has placed on the healthcare system. So um, I think for public health officials, there is an awareness that certainly NCDs are a major factor and it makes managing um, diseases um, such as COVID-19 so much more difficult. The challenge though- Professor Ferguson, you're at two minutes, so please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me find, with, with the, the challenge though, I think our capacity to respond is still limited because the resources are not available. And I think there's need for greater partnerships, public sector, private sector, so that we can respond to both the NCDs and infectious diseases within a reasonable time frame. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Greaves, um, how can we get the political decision making ramped up as a result of this COVID? Dr. Greaves, um, I don't know, maybe yeah. you have. How we can get this yes, how we can get, and thank you very much for the opportunity, and thank you very much for the individual who spoke to me before, I think is um, Mr. Ferguson, Dr. Ferguson. Yes. Yes. Yes, um, thank you very much because you really covered the basis and I wanted to piggyback on, on your point in terms of the whole business of partnership. A government has to foster that partnership to really bring this whole situation to the fore. Political decision making has to take into account that, listen, this is not a government situation. This is not just a government situation. This is bringing the partners on board. This is people bringing people who are in fact afflicted with chronic diseases on board. This is bringing the farmers on board. This is bringing all of civil society organizations on board and not as a token situation, not as a situation where you sit at the table and you already have plans and you're saying, listen, these are the plans guys. What do you think about it? And you have already made your decision, but generally you're not going to take some of those very, very significant pointers from the people who smell the coffee on the ground if you want to put it that way. And it must not be a situation, and it must be from, and I love to say, it has to be from inception to completion and even towards monitoring and evaluation. At all steps of the process, this must be done. And what we need to remove therefore, and I'm sure Dr. Ferguson would agree, what we need to remove is, this, is the sort of suspicion that emanates from these partnerships. You know, I believe, Professor, I believe, Madam Chair, that what we need to understand is that partnership is not something which is automatic. There is no automaticity in terms of entering into partnership 
or behaving like stakeholders or whatever. There's no automaticity in that. That has to be learned. It has to be part of our political decision making. It has to, has to be part of the cultural, political, cultural decision making. Because remember, this is not something that, that we, we grew up doing from inception. It is something that we have to learn and nurture in terms of the politic, particular skill and talent. And one other thing, as we engage in partnerships, every now and then, there would be a need to do what I call a stakeholder analysis. Okay. You're at two minutes now, sir. Okay, just one, just yes. 30 seconds. Yes. A, a, a stakeholder analysis. Are you still on board? Are you still with us in terms of the analysis? What are your objectives? Are you still with us in terms of the objectives? I think we take it for granted that people could be there ad infinitum. What we need to do is do the stakeholder analysis periodically to ensure that people are on board in case they need some further nurturing and education. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The point about whole of society and whole of government interactions not being the automaticity. I don't know if I said it right, um, but I, I thank you very much for that point. Good, thanks. Okay, so I want to go on now to ask um, about food and nutrition insecurity across the region. We have seen that this has become a problem during COVID. And so I wanted to ask, how can NCD commissions build on the political commitment that we hear from our leaders regarding food security to fast track policies that really are healthy food policies as opposed to reducing import bill food policies? Um, can these two things work together? And how can we frame the NCD food policy on the, in the context of the rights and equity issue um, for persons <clears throat> who need to um, feed themselves? So. Uh, Dr. Ramsamy, um, would you like to take two minutes to re respond? Okay, Alafia, I promise you I'm not going to get you to, to stop me at two <laughs> minutes. Um, for my friends on this panel, um, it's nice to be back. It's like a family that have gotten back together. Damien, you make me feel well because I'm not the only one who have lost all his hair. Um, <laughs> but we, <laughs> we, we found ourselves at a time when none of our countries in CARICOM um, have um, achieved the targets that WHO set and that we have at SDG 3.4, meeting their mortality target. 2025, reduced by 25%, WHO target, SDG, 30%, we have not, we are not a target, we are off track. Right. Uh, Dr. Ferguson talked about the interplay between COVID, NCD, nutrition, inequities, and all day today, we have heard that. And because we just have two minutes, I'm not gonna take a lot of time, I'm going to go straight to the opportunity we have with the front of package label that we, oh. it's a good thing to pursue. It's an imperative, we have to, but it's not enough. In 2008 in Rio, we had a declaration for the elimination of industrially produced trans fatty acids. We have made no progress 13 years later. And I think we, we had a deadline, 2023. That is on our doorstep. We've done nothing. In 2019, our countries embarked on making an audit of the food systems, of the food that people use, of the food that are in our supermarkets to see which one are um, rich in trans fat, um, industrially produced trans fat. Guyana completed its I'm not sure many other countries did, but complete it or not, we are not doing anything about it. I think this COVID provides us with a platform that the national commissions should go straight, um, use this as a platform, remind people we have a 2023 deadline and, and embark on an aggressive move because that would be the first risk factor for NCD that we would have globally eliminated if all of our, us were. And Thank some countries have done. Some Thank countries you. have done so. And so, yes, that's my, my, my uh, I want to highlight that. 
Thank you. Straight to the point, Transfat. Let's do it. Okay. Um, Professor Sir Trevor Hassel, can you make your yeah. comments, please? Yeah, so th thanks very much, Alafia. And so really the, the, the nub of the, of the question is, how can national NCD commissions build on the political commitment to fast, track healthy food policy? And over the last, what, seven hours, essentially, that's been the, that's what the conference has been about. And so my first comment would be that national NCD commissions going forward can help to uh, deliver on uh, these many perspectives that have been shared at the conference. But beyond that, national NCD commissions, by virtue of what they are, have the ability to advise ministers of health on the NCD policies and legislation, to recommend research, to assist in mobilizing resources, to promote in collaboration and partnerships, to name but a few, which are, which are all critical components to fast tracking healthy food policy. And because NCD commissions are, are multi-sectoral, they also have the potential to act as a bridge and a link between policymakers and the private sector in, in order to uh, obtain, if you will, uh, an acceptance and support of the private sector of these policies. Of course, commissions are also in this effort well positioned to encourage and to promote policy coherence and conflicts of interest and, and also assist in informing and educating the public so as to really uh, assist the policy makers in enabling them uh, to make their policies. So I think there's a significant role for NCD commissions in that regard. Thank you so much. Three seconds left, but <laughs> thank you for that. Um, okay, so let, let me go on. So the next question has to do with what I call our implementation deficit disorder. Uh, lots of people have spoken about that. Um, we have commitments from the Port of Spain Declaration and other political mandates, which talk about, um, and, and evidence from CAFA, PAHO, and so on, which talk about initiatives that have been shown to be effective, such as um, taxes on sugar-sweetened beverages, school policies, um, labeling, and so on. And yet we are not implementing at the rate that we should be. Um, how do we overcome this, this inertia? And are there any examples from your commission um, working towards introduction of healthy food policies? Dr. Greaves? Um, I think you're still muted, Dr. Greaves. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes, the, um, I, I'm saying from, from the start, we have to think about the lack of political will and how do we drive that political will it has to come from, from the ground. And that is where we have to educate our children because it is said to, we, we, are, we have learned, for example, that um, to fight a war, you need, to, to, you, you, you need to, to go with the army that you have. And what is the army that we have? To really, what is the army that we have? The army that we have would be our children our people on the ground, our consumers. Our consumers must therefore be the ones to be educated, to be advocated to, to put the requisite pressure on those who walk the corridors of power and those who walk the corridors of decision-making basically. And some of the difficulty we have is that, do they know? So they get the information and they, they, we talk about evidence-based information. Do they understand the information? Is sufficient time taken to understand and digest and consume the information to translate it into meaningful, wholesome policy for the consumers? Are our consumer organizations at the table? Are our consumer organizations powerful? How, what is the organization like? Do they have, have they be in, been empowered to do certain things with regard to the information? And perhaps we need to look at the whole business of the pandering by governments to the private sector, because sometimes they feel he helpless and some of them look hapless 
in terms of what is going on and so on. So we, so we have to also tr um, repair that trust deficit between the private sector and the, uh, the pri private health sector and the public health sector. The private health sector in terms of our medical associations, they have to step up to the plate and begin to speak a particular language where they seem to be on the side of consumers. What are we doing with, what are we doing with our Bureau of Standards? My, my, I, I don't want to say too much yet, but the Bureau of Standards again, whose side are you on? Are you on the side of the consumer or are you on the side of the private sector? Or should you be walking the middle of the road and doing exactly what you need to do? What is the Grenada Chronic Disease Commission doing? We have looked at the ban on, on, on the sale of sugar sweetened and carbonated beverages and we are basically partnering with the Ministry of Education in terms of capacity building in primary and secondary schools and parent teachers associations to reduce the risk of diabetes and other chronic diseases among school aged children. And recently we have now looked at the Chronic Disease Commission partnering with the Ministry of Education to look at what we call good, the Good Food Initiative. Because when students are out of school, they do not get that, they do not get the requisite information that they need. So now we are saying when you're at home, here, here are the recipes that we will give you and we hope that this program will run for at least a year and be shared among the Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so now I want to ask uh, Dr. Ramsamy about policy coherence, because when, as you have sat in cabinet meetings, you know, um, so many of them, you would know that the different ministries and different ministers come with different agendas. So for example, right now we have the case where the trade ministers are saying no to front of package labels and the health ministers are saying yes to front of package labels. So how at cabinet level do we get um, some kind of policy coherence in terms of what the government, what the whole of government position is in terms of the priority um, that we place on people's health? So Dr. Ramsamy, can you answer that please? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um... First of all, let me just say this, um, and this is relevant to the policy coherence. And I want to focus on, first of all, the roles of the national commissions, because there are two opportunities to bring uh, stakeholders together, including the different ministries together um, in the next few months. One is um, the CARICOM dialogue on food security, the virtual dialogue that was just completed and President Irfan Ali from Guyana um, presented a food security agenda. And I hope that our commissions will jump aboard and, and, and provide some input in these things um, and let it not go down the road of the Jack Dale Initiative. Um, secondly, there is the food summit that is coming up with ministries of agriculture, ministries of trade, ministries of health, ministries of education that must be involved. I think we could use this Food Summit 2021 for September through the National Commission to start this dialogue of bringing all of these sectors together because our job is one thing, to make people healthy and we have to start in the schools, etc. How do we do this at cabinet level? In Guyana, when I was Minister of Health, um, I led a social sector subcommittee that included all of these players um, because the same people we want to educate to live long, productive lives are the same people that Ministry of Health must deal with, are the same people we're trying to feed through the Ministry of, of, of Trade, etc. So I, I believe these are the things that we have to do. And there is an example in Guyana where to feed children in remote areas, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Health work together for school gardens, um, school kitchens, parents employed in the school kitchen to provide healthy, hot meals for children. That's an example of government working together um, to bring better health for our people. Thank you very much. Um, the Food Summit 
and the challenge you have thrown out to the other NCD commissions to use the food summit to mobilize the different actors. Very well put, thank you very much. Okay, um, so I want to ask um, Sir Trevor Hassel now, how can we use NCD commissions to build the capacity of multi-sectoral actors to address the NCD policies? Yeah, this, this is a particularly important point because, <clears throat> uh, because we need just to step back and remind ourselves, uh, as you said in your introduction, that um, national NCD commissions are platforms for multi-sectoral action, for whole of society, whole of government uh, uh, functioning. And so many of the members of the commissions are not health in the persons. They are in fact uh, non-health, they're private sector, uh, they're civil society, uh, uh, represent civil society organizations uh, without any health background. And so the first important uh, need, if you will, uh, is to inform and educate uh, these, what I refer to as non-health members uh, of, of commissions so that they feel that they are in fact empowered to make meaningful contribution uh, to, to the commission. Uh, the commission then, even as it, as, it, as it does so, then also acts as a resource for these non-health member organizations uh, to themselves then as organizations uh, become engaged uh, in advocacy uh, around NCD prevention and, uh, uh, and, and control. And then in addition to this, the commission then all, uh, uh, all as part of really uh, informing, building capacity, empowering uh, the, the different representatives uh, on the commission, also then uh, can host uh, workshops of of, of, of member organizations. So for example, as I speak, I, I recall um, faith-based organizations having, having a workshop around NCD prevention and control in Barbados, uh, led by the NCD uh, commission. And I think the thing about this, uh, just, to, just to share by way of an example, what this kind of approach can do then, as I said, is encourage member organizations to take their own actions outside of the commission. And one of the best examples in this regard I always mention is that of the Barbados Workers Union. Uh, in fact, not only advocating for a national wellness policy, but also uh, really truly being uh, instrumental uh, with the help of the, of the commission in having uh, such a policy put in place in Barbados. So, uh, and there are other examples, but yeah. time doesn't allow me to go further. Thank, Thank you me. very much. So key point, educate your members so that everybody is on the same page and then they can become advocates and like a multiplier effect. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. So let me ask now about the specifically go back to the question of front of package labeling. Um, what role should the NCD commissions play in ensuring that policymaking is driven by sound scientific evidence? Um, and what, how do we confront the other um, influences, the non-scientific influences that um, actually influence some of how this, these decisions are made? So Professor Ferguson, Okay, so thank you very much again, Professor Samuels. Um, the NCD committees or commissions will have um, persons on that committee who are specialists in um, research and evidence. Um, so for example, in the Jamaica NCD committee, there's a subcommittee that focuses on surveillance and research. Now, what can be done is that the members of that club committee will be able to review the evidence for various policies. So for example, the front of package labeling and put together policy briefs and um, which can be shared with stakeholders. 
what will happen is that because the members of the committee are um, in terms of often respected academics or other leaders in their field, then they will lend their credibility to the recommendations and it will be seen not just as a politically led um, policy, but something that is supported by evidence. So clearly I think the, the ability to review the evidence, to provide policy statements, to meet and to share with stakeholders um, will be a critical component of the NCD committees or the NCD commissions. And of course, we need to build capacity um, where this can be further enhanced, whether through new research um, done by the committee or commissioned by the committee. That of course requires the type of um, personnel and, of, and to some extent funding to ensure that that can be done efficiently. But certainly I think we can provide the type of evidence that will support policy and will lend a greater degree of credibility based on the personnel that are involved. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we, we do recognize um, that even in the face of evidence that there are often decisions made contrary to the evidence for other reasons. And those are some of the real political realities that um, the NCD commissions operate within. Um, so, yes. All right, so the, the final question I'm going to ask and I'm going to ask all the panelists to respond has to do with conflicts of interest. Now, when we talk about firearms and tobacco, it's very clear, it's, there's just no dealing with these um, industries. When we talk about the food industry, however, it is not so clear. And there's a whole range of actors from you know, the, the, the friendly private sector who make profit from selling healthy foods down to the, the other people who you, we talk about, right? So how do NCD commissions address conflict of interest when engaging with health harming commodity industries to advance NCD policies? Um, so I'm going to start with uh, Professor Sir Trevor Hassel and go down the line from there. Sir Trevor? Uh, I think you've, I, so this is a particularly challenging issue. And as we in fact heard earlier, earlier today, the issue of uh, managing conflict of interest, uh, the, the issue of even addressing conflict of interest within the context of the multi-sectoral response to NCDs remains an especially challenging one globally, regionally, nationally, and certainly within national NCD commissions. It is because of, the, of this realization that in fact, over the last few years, the Healthy Caribbean Coalition has, brought, has sought to bring this issue to the fore, if only to have a discussion uh, on the issues, uh, even as we sought to provide some level of guidance. But as I said, it's a, a, a particularly challenging issue and I would not wish to advance that, uh, certainly from the perspective of the Barbados National NCD Commission, that we have, been, we have effectively addressed uh, this issue. Having said that, the Barbados NCD Commission does have a uh, uh, private sector representation. And um, uh, the, that level of private sector representation is not at the level of the unhealthy commodities interest, industry, but the healthy commodities industry. Uh, interestingly enough, as an aside, as a result of that particular private sector industry representation on the NCD Commission, uh, that company is seen as one of the leading uh, private sector company organizations in the region and quite often is, is uh, promoted 
by the Healthy Caribbean Coalition as demonstrating international best practice of uh, the private sector being engaged uh, in the multi-sector uh, response. Uh, so I'm going to uh, end my comment at that point. And if there's an opportunity later, maybe I may, I may dare to address some of the more difficult and, and complex issues. And just to give you a quick cite, for example, uh, for the most part, uh, the nature of national NCD commissions, they are, they are quote unquote creatures of the uh, ministries of health and creatures of government. And, and so uh, the, the membership of the commissions are determined uh, by, uh, by, by the appropriate uh, uh, government uh, minister. I've often wondered and been intrigued at the thought of, co of commissions in the Caribbean with uh, membership that included uh, the representatives of the unhealthy commodities industry. And I've often <laughs> wondered how we would manage such a how, how would we manage indeed? Yes. Indeed, quite a challenge. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> Professor Ferguson, uh, I know that you are recently appointed, but we still are going to ask you, what is your plan for dealing with conflict of interest? Yeah, so thanks again. So I think clearly it is something that has to be discussed and um, conflicts of interest has to be declared where they exist. Um, one of the, I think it, it can be looked at both from the individual level as well as from the broader commission. So. For example, individuals in their private capacity may own shares or interest in companies. Um, persons may also receive research funding from companies. And um, I don't think that it may be easy to make a blanket statement to say one ought not to invest in a private company or should not receive research funds from a company, etc. I think one of the things which Sir Trevor pointed out is the, the degree to which companies are compliant with general recommendations. The difficulty there is that we may need some sort of a rating agency to say which companies are compliant and which are not. <laughs> so that will become a, a, a challenge. Um, so I think, first of all, though, it is acknowledging that it exists, um, being willing to deal with it. Um, in some agencies, for example, they recommend for individual investments to go more for like mutual funds and um, unit trusts, etc. So it does not, um, the, the, that issue of being, you know, involved too much in a particular company may not become um, as dominant. Clearly, it will be important for them to, for all of the, the, the various companies to be included in the discussions um, as it's related, but for individuals, one has to be careful the extent to which one has either ownership, interest, or receive any type of support or sponsorship from these companies because it certainly will not um, reflect well and our credibility will be compromised because persons will be asking, how can you be, you know, taken from this person and then recommending against the things that they are promoting. So it will become a challenge, but we have to continue to discuss and to work out best practices. Okay, thank you so much. Dr. Greaves, what has been your experience? Well, to tell you the truth, it is a challenge. We have discussed it at the level of the Chronic Disease Commission. And we had a, a bit of fortune in that we had the president of the Grenada Industry, um, Grenada Chamber, of Commerce and Industry actually part of the Chronic Disease Commission. And, and, and that individual was the president, as I said, but since he exited the scene or demitted office as president of the, of the Grenada Chamber of Commerce and so on, uh, we have not had a replacement. And I, and I believe I know why we have not had a replacement and we have been sending letters and, and making <laughs> phone calls to try to get a replacement, but we have not been successful thus far. In fact, the individual who was, who, who was tipped to, to, to replace um, this individual um, to attend meetings of the Chronic Disease Commission, I, I can't get him to attend at this time. And I think it will be even more difficult now 
to do so. But I want to enjoy, endorse the views and the, um, and the summations of, of, of the two colleagues who preceded me in that it is a challenge, it is difficult, the conversation must go on. It's a hot potato issue that we, that we may have to drop and pick up at intervals, but we cannot afford to kick the can down the road because this is, this is a real issue for our consumers. And again, um, I am a strong advocate for the fact that we educate our consumers as much as possible to help. Because if we can get, <laughs> the Chinese talk about the bottom up, um, bottoms up and so on. If we can get our consumers to begin to, to take charge by, by giving them the requisite information, skill, and the requisite um, empowerment um, that they need, then I think that would be part of the difficulty that we can, we can uh, at least overcome. And, and that's how I see it going forward. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Ramsamy, I'm giving you the final word. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want to um, change that conflict of interest formula. I, I, I fully agree with both Trevor's and Damien, um, resource rich corporations and so called on duly influence scientists, politicians, etc. But I want to bring it down to a more fundamental level of companies, corporations, small businesses, big businesses, protecting their bottom line and um, public health officials, et cetera, government wanting to protect the health of their people. Two opposite, um, but they don't have to be because I believe all of us have no conflict of interest in terms of wanting everyone to be healthy. A healthy population, a long living population will support business better than sick people can or that dead people can. And therefore we have to bring everybody to see that. We have to see that we are not in conflict. We're not fighting each other, but we are trying to create a more productive environment, an environment in which all of us can flourish and prosper and all of us could attain our life's goals. Um, so that's another part that we have to do. And that's how we brought along some of the stakeholders with tobacco. And don't forget the infant formula, the baby food industry that we have brought a long way, maybe not every to the distance we want them, but we have brought them a long way. And we were able to address some of those conflicts between our different goals um, by bringing that, that superior goal of um, healthier lives, healthier people, a better country. I think that's what our, our goal, and we don't have a conflict. We need to remind people and bring them back to that place. So that would be my conclusion on that. Thank, thank you so much for closing us off on such an aspirational um, desire. And we certainly hope that we can get there um, one day. Um, we still have a lot of challenges though. You talk about the, the baby friendly hospital and the infant feeding. As soon as you take your eye off them, they're back in the hospital. So it's an ongoing challenge that we have in dealing um, with the private sector. But I do agree with you that we need to have a shared vision um, and we need all to work towards that shared vision. So with those few words, I'd like to thank my four panelists, um, Professor Sir Trevor Hassel, Dr. Greaves, Professor Ferguson, and um, Dr. Ramsamy. And um, let me turn back over now to Maisha for her closing words. Thank you so much.